gentlemen, dear friends in Greece and abroad, welcome to our fourth lecture of the series related to the Greek Revolution of 1821, the third for this year, uh, and the last before the summer break. Uh, we thank you for joining us in this lecture that uh, as those who have attended before know that the British Embassy organizes in collaboration with the newspaper Tovima. The lecture is being uh, also uh, live streamed on YouTube uh, so that people can follow it uh, at their ease later, those who cannot join us live now. Uh, this is the live session and we are very happy to have with us tonight Professor Constantina Bocciu, who is uh, uh, Associate Professor uh, at the University of Peloponnese and also the director for the Center of Greek and International History at the University of the Peloponnese and who will be speaking to us tonight on the theme from the small Greek state to greater Greece, the great idea in British politics in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, just a few words about the running order of tonight's event. Uh, immediately now the ambassador, Ms. Kate Smith, will uh, give a short address presenting uh, Professor Bosiu and uh, referring to the series. And then Professor Bosiu will uh, speak and there will be a Q&A session at the end uh, of the, the evening. Uh, those of you who would like to uh, can raise their questions uh, at the Q&A uh, part of the presentation even during the, the speech, uh, those questions that will be answered in the course of the speech will not be addressed at the end, and those who have not been answered will be addressed at the end. I wish to you all a, an enjoyable evening. We're looking forward to listening to Professor Bosiu and thank her once again. And I now give the floor to the ambassador, uh, Ms. Kate Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christo. And uh, good evening, everybody. Kalispera, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and um, friends, dear friends. It's a great pleasure, as always, to see you. Well, I can't see you, but uh, to see you virtually um, at tonight's uh, fourth 1821 lecture with the title From the Small Greek State to Greater Greece. The Great Idea in the Galia there and British Politics in the 19th and 20th century by Professor Constantina Botsu and as uh, Christo said, jointly organized by the British Embassy in Athens and Torvima newspaper. Uh, so we began this series last year with the British historian, David Brewer. Uh, we continued at the beginning of this year uh, with professors Stefanidis and Unaris uh, from Thessaloniki on the revolution and Britain's splendid flexibility. Um, and then in March, uh, with Professor Maria Skina on Byron's poetic revolution. Now, very different subjects, but all of these lectures uh, move around the overall theme of Britain, Britons, and the Greek Revolution, and examine different aspects of our old, deep, and multifaceted relationship. So, after a poetic uh, break with Byron, um, we are coming back today to the core issues of diplomacy and uh, international relations so, so closely linked to the Greek revolution itself and to the way they shaped Greece's uh, foreign policy throughout the 19th century and the early part of the 20th, with Britain, of course, always a key player. Now, we all have our different views on these issues, but we're lucky enough to have with us tonight an expert speaker who uh, has both studied uh, this issue in detail and is well known for her lucidity and sophistication as a public speaker. So um, let me present her briefly. Um, Constantina Botsu is Associate Professor and Director of the Center for Greek and International History at the University of the Peloponnese, where she, she has also served as Vice Rector. She's also a visiting professor at the Hellenic National Defence College and general director of the Council for International Relations. She served as a lecturer and deputy director at the Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence at the University of Athens and general director and vice president at the Constantinos Karamanlis Institute for Democracy. Among other positions she, she has held, 
Uh, she was a board member at the National Library of Greece, the Hellenic Parliament Foundation, and the Academic Council of the Martins Center for European Studies. Her recent publications include The Balkans in the Cold War in 2017, The Civil Wars of the Greek Revolution in 2021, and 1821 from the Revolution to the State, co-edited with uh, Professor Sotiris Rizas, which is to be published shortly this year. So um, we look forward very shortly um, to hearing uh, Professor Botsu. Um, this, as Crystal said, will be our last lecture before the summer break. And I really hope when we um, reconvene in the autumn, it might be in a live or a, a hybrid form, but at least some of us can actually get together face to face in the autumn. That would be wonderful. Uh, so without uh, more ado uh, from me, I will hand give the floor to Professor Bozio. Uh, the floor is yours. Your Excellency, Madam Ambassador, dear Chairman, dear organizers, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am profoundly honored to participate in the British Embassy program on the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution. Your Excellency, Ms. Kate Smith, thank you so much for the invitation and for the kind introduction. As implied by the title of my ambitious speech, I will discuss British influence on the size and shape of the Greek state, which took over one century to finalize after independence, actually between 1830 and 1947. Theoretically, the doctrine of Greek redentism and national integration Imagali Idea had been terminated long before the final act, the inclusion of the Dodecanese Islands in 1947 as a result of Greece's participation in the Second World War. Militarily, it was indeed terminated in the ruins of the Asia Minor campaign. But politically and ideologically, it continued to govern Greek politics far beyond 1922. To some observers, it was actually instrumental in the activation and popularization of the Cyprus issue as late as the 1950s and the 1960s. Since history is mistakenly read backwards, very often, the Greek-British dispute over Cyprus is often a distorting lens in assessing bilateral relations in the 19th and early 20th century. Therefore, according to an established interpretation or misinterpretation, Great Britain is considered the most conservative great power towards the great idea. London, the story goes, supported adamantly the status quo after the Napoleonic Wars, hence blocking Greece's territorial expansion at the expense of the Ottoman Empire that lay at, heart, at the heart of the great idea. A popular explanation is that apart from a handful of liberal philalens, Britain was governed by an ultra-conservative political establishment that had more confidence in the Ottoman Empire as a bulwark against Russia, Britain's paramount strategic concern, than to the small Christian buffer states in the Balkans. The weakness of those states, as well as their century-old pro-Russian predisposition, turned away British elites. Some regretted the support given to the Greek Revolution in the first place. Famous quotes are used to underscore this notion, such as the aphorism of the Duke of Wellington in January 1828, that naval battle of Navarino three months earlier had been an unfortunate event, or the description of the great idea as a leprosy, lepra, by prominent Greek Anglophiles after the Crimean War. In the same vein, George Canning, William Gladstone, or Lloyd George are praised as bright intervals in the dark road that led to the end of the tunnel, namely the Balkan Wars. Britain finally abandoned the status quo policy simply because the status quo was not sustainable anymore. In the First World War, 
the Sigman of Europe proved a liability to the West, above all to Britain, the core Western power. Well, historical archives and facts tell us a somewhat different story. Namely that Britain, the Aglia, as referred to in many documents, consistently promoted the idea of a greater Greece on a long-term basis, more than any other great power. The most telling result is the country's geography and geopolitics. Greece's strategic position up to this very day as a Western security provider in the Eastern Mediterranean is basically the outcome of the orientation that the great idea took under British influence. The key lies, of course, in the phrase long-term planning. A striking difference with the understandable Greek efforts to exploit here and now every chance for territorial aggrandizement in case that chance were the last one. This discrepancy, almost typical between a great power and an emerging state, leaves ample room for controversy and misinterpretation. I will try to sustain this argument from four angles, historical, ideological, strategic, political. But first, I considered it necessary to remind some general principles of British politics in Europe between the Greek Revolution and the early 20th century. Definitely, Great Britain supported the post-1815 status quo. However, not out of an inherited trochophile stance, but in order to recover from the disastrous Napoleonic Wars and concentrate on the evolution of the empire. This did not prevent it from promoting piecemeal geopolitical change, which in fact favored the Greeks. The explanation lay both in modern ideology and traditional politics. In geopolitical terms, right after the Napoleonic Wars, Russia increased pressure on Constantinople as the protector of Orthodox peoples. This meant an effort to redraw the map through the creation of small and dependent Orthodox Balkan states that would enable Russian control over the strategic routes between the Dardanelles and the Eastern Mediterranean. The very routes that were vital to British naval supremacy in the region. Since British-Russian antagonism permitted the European balance of powers, but a general war was out of the question in the name of international peace, the solution ran through repeated British-Russian compromises. The creation of modern Greece was one of them. As a matter of fact, it was the first one after the Vienna Congress. Britain's policy for containing Russian expansionism led first to the formation of an independent, not just an autonomous Greek state, and second, prepared the ground for Greece's territorial growth so that it would be able to resist both Ottoman counter-attacks as well as Russian overtures. On the ideological level, the defeat of Napoleon and the restoration of the ancient regime to which Britain had greatly contributed, did not mean the reversal of history. Britain realized the undefeatable power of nationalism and got prepared to embrace inevitable political change. The support of the Greek Revolution, financial, political, military, was a clear and still careful indication. The formation of independent buffer states between France and Russia fell in the same pattern. Switzerland, Belgium, Luxembourg, the expanded Netherlands, later Italy and Germany. In a sense, as the oldest parliamentary democracy in European affairs, Britain represented the principles of liberalism and nationalism after France's defeat but with a spirit of reform, not radical regime change. The Enlightenment was a part of that scheme. 
Britain promoted systematically the political idea of modern Greece. The political idea of Greece as a fundament of the West. Philhellenism, which found in Lord Byron its leading international symbol and was most active in London, became actually the modern equivalent to the Greek pre-modern religious identity in the Orthodox Milet. That school of thought was reflected in the promotion of the Greek Revolution as a national one by Alexandros Mavrokordatos, the most prominent Greek Anglophile. Nation and Christianity, modern and pre-modern, merged into an acceptable hybrid version of nationalism. Later on, the establishment of an autocephalous Greek church with British support served similar purposes. If revolutionary France had been instrumental in shaping a modern Greek political ideology, reformist Britain became the source of Greece's modern political identity. Regarding Britain's long-term planning in the great idea, let me briefly outline the four points I mentioned earlier. First of all, Greece was conceived as a strategic partner of Britain. The British supported the Greek cause before the beginning of the revolution. George Canning as foreign minister between 1822 and 1827 was a tremendous asset for the Greek cause. However, his predecessor, Viscount Castlery, had already described the inevitability of the struggle and the need to find a solution without direct foreign interference. Moreover, the archival sources show that, for instance, Mavrokordatos had been in contact with British diplomacy well before the eruption of hostilities. In 1820, we know he was meeting with the Pisan Circle, the Shelleys, for instance, and was winning some famous advocates of the Greek cause. When Lord Byron came to Greece in December 1823, to prepare a report in view of the so-called revolutionary loans, financial support and de facto political recognition of the insurgents had already been cited in London, even though it was too early to tell whether the, whether the Greeks could win. After the initial narrow Greek borders were drawn in 1832, the question was, not so much whether Greece would gain more irredenta, but when and to what direction. To the British, the answer was obvious, gradually to the sea. This brings me to my second point. Modern Greece was preconceived as a maritime partner. The great idea developed a naval center of gravity. For quite some decades before 1821, the Greeks had dominated international trade in Ottoman waters with one of the largest and modern merchant fleets. They commanded Russian wet trade in the entire Mediterranean, Greek communities extended from the Eastern to the Western Mediterranean. Greeks broke the French and British blockades during the Napoleonic Wars, attracting attention as a promising regional naval force. No one could use the Aegean Sea better than the Greeks as a trap for the enemy and a corridor for friendly powers. Naturally, the contribution of the Greek ships and islands to the Greek revolution cannot be overrated, cannot be overstated. Needless to say, starting with Chios, Psara, Kassos, Idra, Spetses, the islands were registered as pro-British. A salient feature of the Greek Revolution was also the implicit danger of commercial disruption in case it found no support by the great powers. For instance, the paramount aim of Ioannis Kapodistrias as governor was to persuade the British that an independent Greece would rid them of piracy. Greece's first territorial gains concerned a maritime area, namely the Ionian Islands that were ceded by Britain in 1864 when the royal dynasty changed as well. The far more complex expansion towards Crete and the Aegean Islands 
followed the rocky path of the great idea against the Ottoman Empire. However, in Britain's view, the Greeks were the natural heirs to the Ottoman possessions. Even though Bulgaria emerged as a potential third force in Northern Aegean between 1875 and 1915, Panslavism on the one hand and the alliance with the Central Powers on the other in the First World War undermined the rapprochement with Britain that has started, for instance, under Alexander Battenberg. Geopolitical priorities were fully understood by Eleftheros Venizelos. He disposed of a global view of Greek politics. He faced a major geopolitical dilemma in 1914, when Greece was offered either Northern Epirus or the Northern Aegean Islands. Following the maritime center of gravity, Venizelos decided for the latter, leaving the former to the newly formed state of Albania and hoping for a better future arrangement. As a Cretan, Venizelos totally shared the British understanding that Greece's independence depended upon its naval power. And to play that role, it absolutely needed Crete and the Aegean Islands. But this could never be safe if they were not protected by Macedonia and Thrace. Therefore, Venizelos became famous for resisting his compatriots' pressure to enter the Greek parliament before Macedonia had been integrated into the Greek territory. With good reason, as in Crete, the Greeks had only one weak and lonely competitor, the Ottoman Empire. In Macedonia, they had at least two, the Turks and the Bulgarians who sought to establish a hegemony with Russia in the background. Actually, the Greeks felt quite lonely while fighting on two fronts between 1885 and 1915. Some ruling elites alienated themselves from British diplomacy and tried alternative alliances, above all with Germany since Panslavism excluded Russia. The national schism of 1915 between Venizelos and Germanophile King Constantine I was rooted in that bitter experience. A long-lasting byproduct was also Greek suspicion towards everything British. As Britain represented the West and the idea of the West, anti-Western sentiments were later translated into anti-Americanism too, when the US replaced Britain as the main foreign influence in the Civil War. The significance of the Greek fleet was not lost to the Balkan neighbors. In 1912, the Bulgarians sought an alliance with Greece, counting on the naval protection of the territories they coveted in Macedonia and Thrace. Needless to say, the Greek seas and the Greek navy played a decisive role in the Balkan Wars and in both world wars. The third point I would like to make concerns the Mediterranean component of the Eastern question. Britain treated the Eastern question as a Mediterranean issue, to which Greece was a key. That approach had two advantages. First, the Mediterranean issues lay typically outside the Russian sphere of influence. And second, the erosion of the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean did not affect the British status quo doctrine in continental Europe. The subtle distinction was evident in the two Ottoman Egyptian wars of 1831-33 and 1839-41. In the second Near Eastern crisis, Britain accepted the gradual autonomization of Egypt and secured the closure of the Straits to Russian ships through the London Convention of 1841. It also tamed the dynamic comeback of France, which the British themselves had encouraged for outweighing the Russians. France's return to the Eastern Mediterranean had become visible in the Greek War of Independence. After participating in the Battle of Navarino, King Charles X dispatched significant military forces under General Maison to liberate the Peloponnese 
from the remnants of Ibrahim's army. Following the 1830 July Revolution, the new King Louis Philippe sided fully with the British. Russia sought to break British French cooperation in the Crimean War. That war was triggered far away from the Black Sea, again in the Eastern Mediterranean, when Russia, feeling strong enough now after the Napoleonic Wars, sought to protect the Orthodox Church against the French-sponsored Catholics. Within Greece, France played a similar balancing role on Britain's side. Various Greek leaders and King Otto himself relied on the so-called French party. The French party and its leader Ioannis Coletis, the father of Great Idea actually, promoted redentism without exposing the English party or inviting the Russian party. In the British-French cooperation, Britain remained the senior partner. The French were eagerly engaged and supported frequently the powerful British weapon, naval blockades, another source of bitterness by the Greeks after they started in Greek ports in 1850 with the Parkerica. Eloquently, the language is always right, in the First World War, the Greeks used the single word aglogali and for their enemies, germano vulgari. My fourth point concerns Britain's vital geopolitical difference with Russia. British insistence on the status quo in the Eastern question was not driven primarily by the weakness of the Ottoman Empire, but rather by the strength of the Russian Empire. And this is something that we often miss in our analysis. After the Vienna Congress in 1815, Britain and Russia were the mightiest great powers in the world. Only when Russia showed an irreversible decline, especially after its defeat by Japan in 1904, Britain openly encouraged the Greeks to fulfill the great idea, both northwards and southwards. Things were different in 1821. Britain had been expecting a Russian move in the Balkans since 1815. The Serbian revolt during the Napoleonic Wars, actually two revolts, 1804 to 13 and 1815 to 17, had been an early warning signal. Whereas Tsar Alexander I was dissatisfied with Russia's reward for Napoleon's defeat. Since 1814, Russia practically hosted the Filikieteria, promoted potential Greek leaders like Apodistias and military officers like Epsilantis, gave funds and room for revolutionary preparation in the Danubian principalities that were autonomous. All in all, the Greek Revolution was an accident waiting to happen. The conflicting aims of Britain and Russia were taken into consideration by the architects of the Greek Revolution. Deliberately, in my view, the revolution exploded exactly when the two great powers were too exhausted to fight each other, but also too involved to see the revolution suppressed by the Holy Alliance, as the case was in the Italian territories or Spain. The expected British-Russian compromise was reached in many ways. A distant case was Capodistria's appointment in 1827 as first governor between two British military leaders, General Richard Church and Admiral Thomas Cochrane. Anglo-Russian competition continued unabated throughout the 19th century. The various peaks included the Crimean War, 18. 53 to 56, the Great Eastern Crisis of 1875 to 78, and the several local Greek uprisings, which sometimes entailed pan-Balkan cooperation efforts. The emergence of Bulgaria in the 1870s practically terminated such rapprochement as the Greeks distanced themselves from Slavic aims. The Balkan Wars constituted a short-term deviation from the Greek strategy of the weak neighbor, 
in the late 19th century, a strategy which considered the declining Ottoman Empire a lesser threat than the forceful Slavic nationalism from the north. The Greek Civil War in the 1940s merged that traditional Slavic enemy, the national enemy, with the arising ideological opponent. Again, the language reflected that with the word Slavo-Communismos. When the Ottoman Empire disintegrated in the First World War, Balkan geopolitics followed the horizontal British perspective of the 19th century, not the Russian or the Austrian vertical one. Bulgaria was locked behind the Straits, whereas Greece and Turkey shared the sea routes to the Eastern Mediterranean, possessing the Aegean Sea and the Dardanelles, respectively. Thanks to British, French and American initiatives, Albania and Yugoslavia were created as larger states than originally anticipated by Russia and Austria, who preferred small states in the Balkans. Russia and Austria had also envisaged the vertical division in order to dominate the Eastern and Western Balkans, respectively. The Greeks were crucial for the Russians, Bosnia and Herzegovina for the Austrians, in order to control the Aegean and the Adriatic. Britain's long-term planning for the great idea is reflected in a prediction made by George Canning in 1823. The Turks, he said, would someday follow the Greek paradigm of state organization and international orientation. His prediction materialized a hundred years later, with the establishment of the Turkish nation state by Mustafa Kemal. After joining NATO, Greece and Turkey became compelled to cooperate in the long run and compete in the short run. Britain had a great share in the creation of that geometry, of the long-term setting that secured Greece and Turkey the luxury to compete mostly in peace. That setting seemed almost impossible from the viewpoint of small Greece in 1830-1832, but not from the British perspective. Thank you very much for your attention. And hear you. Apologies, you cannot hear me because I had not unmuted myself. Apologies to you and all. Uh, I just wanted to say that we want to thank you. As the ambassador said, your uh, presentation analysis was indeed very perceptive and uh, it uh, provided various points for consideration, including on projections to the present state of affairs, apart from historical affairs, uh, to which uh, you so expertly uh, referred to and, and expanded. Uh, I'd like to invite anyone with any questions to place them at the Q&A session. There is one already. Uh, by Mr. Thomas Vajor, you. So if you would like to answer that question. Yes, I can see it. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, well, as I said before, naval blockades were, were a weapon in the hands of the naval power, Britain, and the other naval power, France. And they were used uh, repeatedly against Greece uh, in case Greece uh, wouldn't uh, follow uh, the, the politics of uh, Britain at that time towards the, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but the main point uh, I, I made, and I, I think I, it's the, the time to repeat it, is that we very often confuse the long-term perspective and the short-term perspective. The short-term perspective was that uh, uh, Greece had to grow as uh, uh, quickly as it could before other competitors came in the, into the picture. But at the same time, the British had other considerations to take into account. That's why they um, hindered uh, the Greeks from expansion and sometimes they also used uh, violence 
uh, to do that. Uh, this doesn't change the general picture. And the general picture is that when, for instance, Britain, uh, together with Russia and France, became the guarantor powers, uh, not typically, but um, practically, uh, in uh, 1830, they did not uh, guarantee the Ottoman borders, which means they left that perspective open for the future. But in the perspective of Greek power, that planning takes a long time, a much longer time than, than the Greek uh, planning of that period. On the other hand, we have to take into account that uh, Greece was still permitted very much by Russian influence. Not all uh, leaders and leaderships that uh, were available in Greece in the 19th century uh, followed necessarily the Western path. And that was uh, quite uh, a threat for, uh, uh, for the British if we take into account the fact that Russia was a mighty great power and won uh, the, Ottoman, the, the war against the Ottoman Empire in 1877-1878. And uh, it was exactly that period when the Ottomans ceded Cyprus to the British in order to get protected in the Eastern Mediterranean by perhaps another Russian uh, overture, another Arsh uh, Russian attack. So uh, what you say does not uh, really contradict what I say, but uh, it's different to uh, take a view of the shorter uh, vision of things at that time, which is totally natural uh, on the Greek side and a totally different thing to look at uh, those uh, developments uh, uh, in uh, the duration of one century. Right. Um, I don't see any other questions, but uh, just to give time to people to come up with questions, perhaps may I uh, uh, use my privilege <laughs> to place a question of my own. Uh, I would like your comment, please, on what you think about so if, if Venizelos's decision to send the Greek army to Smyrna in Asia Minor was dictated by the great idea principles that he, along other pol Greek politicians, the majority or totality of Greek politicians at the time espoused, uh, or was it motivated by a desire to protect the sea routes, the Aegean, Crete, whatever, not just from the north, but from the east as well? Or was it a combination of considerations? Thank you. Uh, it was both. And uh, a third one um, must also be put on the table that Venizelos wanted also to protect the Greeks that were living in Asia Minor. And uh, he had promised them, Greece had promised them for generations that they would become integrated into the Greek state. That was the heyday of, uh, Greek, uh, of the Greek great idea, Greek nationalism, and of Greece's strategy. Uh, the plan was uh, brilliant. Of course, it was risky. And it proved disastrous in the end, as uh, also the anti venizelists despite their Germanophile uh, predisposition, followed more or less Venizelist plans in order to expand into Anatolia. Venizelos wanted to control both sides of the Aegean. Uh, and uh, that was a great chance for him and for Greece, since he knew that he had the backing of the great powers, especially Britain and Lloyd George, who was uh, perhaps more enthusiastic than he should have been regarding the geopolitical realities, but he totally trusted Venizelos and believed that the Greeks should be uh, the heirs to the Ottoman Empire, that the Ottoman Empire would, uh, uh, was uh, extinct anyway, and that the new state that would take its um, place would be a very small one and very weak, too weak to, uh, to be reliable especially after its stance in the First World War. Things changed, of course, in the Asia Minor campaign. So Venizelos uh, tried to, to realize what lay at the heart of all Greeks at that time. It was geopolitically well-conceived, and it also relied on the fact that uh, Greece on the West and Armenia on the East would suppress the small Turkish state that would come out of uh, the ruins of the First World War. Things changed totally in 1921 and end of 1920, beginning of 1921. And it, there lies also the responsibility of the anti-Venizelist uh, leadership, that they didn't follow the geopolitical changes. And to some point, uh, they were uh, so anxious to prove that they were also patriots and wanted to uh, 
see Greece larger that they didn't tell the truth, either to themselves or to the Greeks there and back home. We've got another question by Mr. Spiro Frambugliari. Let me see it. How can Anglo-Hellenic relations improve from now on and into the future? Well, first of all, I think they're quite good. And uh, they're all, they have always been, except for uh, uh, the quite long era of the Cyprus uh, agitation and this, uh, the problems on Cyprus. But uh, you see they're both uh, maritime states. They both uh, ha have a, ve a very strong common history together. Uh, after Brexit, um, uh, we have to face many uh, questions in Greece. And one of them is how we can further strengthen our relationship with Britain, as we have always been uh, with Brit the British uh, in all major uh, adventures of modern history, I mean, and I mean wars, I mean um, uh, periods of crisis. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of things in common, ex except for education. So many Greek students study there. Um, uh, the shipping industry is very strongly connected with uh, Britain and the shipping industry of Greece is uh, one of the most uh, competitive sectors for Greece, we're a superpower there. I don't know any other sector where Greece can uh, pride itself uh, in such uh, an achievement. Um, definitely we have common strategic interests in the Eastern Mediterranean. Cyprus should unite us and not uh, uh, tear us apart. Uh, so I think that uh, in the future we'll see more of uh, closer Greek-British relations in the many areas, including the three areas I mentioned before. Uh, I just had another question. Thank you, Aristides uh, Hadzis, uh, Professor Hadzis, for the comment. Uh, well, uh, this is a very uh, interesting point. Uh, the US was the young uh, great power that came into the First World War. Actually, uh, Wilson's uh, vision for the world and uh, the self-autonomy uh, um, uh, that uh, he, um, self-determination uh, that was included in the 14 points of uh, Wilson's vision was the basis for Greek, uh, the Greek great idea, for the realization of the Greek great idea by that time. But I think it was too early to believe that uh, uh, the US would uh, take up so many responsibilities as the British had taken before, even if, let's say the what if in history, which is, does not exist, but let's play that game, even if the US had remained in the game had not uh, returned to isolationism. I think the Americans were much more mature as a great power, as a superpower then, uh, to rely on in the Second World War. Uh, but uh, definitely the American vision of the world before the Senate uh, um, rejected uh, the Versailles Treaty which included also the Armenian future, the future of the Armenian state and the future of the Greek state, were a major influence on Venizelos' uh, uh, thinking. We don't know how it would have been uh, developed. Any other final questions, perhaps? No. Well, thank you, Professor Bozzi. Once again, it was a very interesting lecture, uh, uh, and I'm sure that uh, people, many more people, will enjoy uh, listening and seeing it on YouTube uh, in the days to come. Thank you once again very much, and thank you all for attending and for your questions. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the entire organization and for the questions of dear friends and colleagues that have uh, found time to uh, listen to us and see us. Watch us. Right. Thank you all. Goodbye.